him so long, you probably think you know him well. But I think you'll be surprised to meet the husband, father, painter, poet, behind one of rock and roll's most enduring names, John Mellencamp. As you'll find out over the next hour, he's a study in contrast. To start with, he was born in a small town, made his name on the road, but never really left home. Seymour is really a small town, and it has really small town values. Everybody knows what everybody's doing, and I think they really think it's their business to know <laughs> what, what the neighbor's doing. It was the baby boom generation, and I mean, when I was growing up, there was kids in every house. There was never any lack of anybody to play with or mischief to get into. Uh, girls, I mean, there were lots of girls. I mean, there was a litany of things to do. Plus, I was in a rock band. You know, there was a time period in the mid to late 60s that, you know, I was dragging down 120 bucks a week. That was a lot of money back then for a 15-year-old boy to have. I had a great time growing up in Indiana. I think it was like the great American dream. And I want my kids to have that same experience. Please welcome John Mellencamp. Listen to that tape, it, uh, it occurred to me, you've been a rock star every day of your life for four decades, and that would about be the American dream, wouldn't it? Well, I tell you, it was, uh, it's a lot different than you might think. I, I grew up in public, as you did. We grew up in public. People saw all our, uh, not, not you, but in my case, <laughs> saw all my mistakes and warts and bad songs that I wrote and bad performances. and. So there's an advantage to that, there's also a disadvantage. But uh, I am a grown man living a teenager's dream, yes. <laughs> you grown up yet? Uh, I think I'm house broke now. <laughs> we were, I'm not sensitive about this, I probably talk about it too much, but um, I'm going to uh, turn one year older than you at the end of this month. And you just turned 53. Mm -hmm. Did you ever dream that you would be still working and at this level? In your 50s? I, uh, I don't understand why she's one year older than me and I look like a piece of luggage. <laughs> and she still looks great. How, did, how does that I work? Have, I didn't have as much fun as you did. No, no, no. <laughs> you have lived in our native Indiana all of your life. You were able to, but you also chose to. Was there ever a time when you might have decided otherwise or was it the only choice you would have made? I just, uh, you know, when I came to New York the first time in 1974, uh, a, a, you know, a, a kid from Indiana, and people would say to me, man, you talk just like a hillbilly. I am. You know, and I just didn't fit in. I never fit in here. I, uh, uh, I always got in trouble when I was a kid in the city, you know, and it was, it was like this for me, oil and water. So I just always needed a place to go back to. At what point in your... Uh career did you become a serious songwriter a writer of serious songs well when I was a, you know when I first started out I was a, I was very cavalier as a young man very cavalier I and I uh, I really wasn't too responsible to myself and about 1982 a record company executive came up to me and he said you know Mellencamp if you don't start taking your job but more serious we're gonna drop you from the label what you're going to do what? You can do that? So, I think it was at that point where I was kind of threatened that maybe you won't be making records if you don't take it more seriously. So I kind of got more serious about it. And of course, you know, when, when, when I got my first record deal, I'd only ever written two songs. So, the idea of me writing songs never occurred to me. So, uh, you know, I had to spend time 
learning how to write songs, what that meant, how to try to write more than a pop song. So, you know, there was a lot of work for me to do. I just saw a, a rough cut of a, your new video. It's not, not out yet. It was incredibly moving. Uh, it's based on uh, uh, the new track from your uh, greatest hit CD just out called Walk Tall. But it, about tolerance, I think people will be talking about this video. Well, I think that, it, you know, people in the United States, you know, we all want the same thing. I think, you know, if you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, we all want the same thing. We want a place where our kids can, can grow up uh, and, and have respect for each other. We, we, we want to be able to use the freedoms that the Constitution uh, gives us. And, 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 and bigotry is such a, a mean and hateful thing. And I think that video shows how obtuse that bigotry really is. Would you tell what the, what the twist on tolerance is in the video? In the video, all of the couples are uh, white and black. So that's the norm, white people with black people. But small people are the outcasts, let's just say. They're the ones that, that can't be served in restaurants. They're the ones that can't drink out of the water fountains. And you just see that and you think, that's so ridiculous. What if we, you know, we're bigoted against the little people? And we're not, but so, you know, if you're black or if you're an American Indian, there's so many, you know, uh, hate, like it says in the song, bigotry and hatred are enemies to us all, but grace, mercy, and forgiveness will help a man walk tall. And I think that's what really what the video is about. We're going to clear the decks right now, and you and the band are going to perform Walk Tall, which is from your new CD, Words and Music, John Mellencamp's Greatest Hits.
back home again in Indiana, where the rock star is best known as Dan. Next. Later this week on the Jane Pauley Show, She's Hired. Wednesday, The Apprentice's Carolyn talks about life in the boardroom. Juicy beef, two kinds of beans, tomatoes, onions, peppers, preservative free. It's all inside. Stag Chili is the chili chili lovers love. It's not a very good story. I remember the video shoot. When she showed up, she was too pretty and too young. And so I had words with the photographer. Said, she's not right for this. And she's a kid. And she hated me immediately because she heard me yelling at this guy. I guess I didn't see him at his best. Then I didn't see her for like six months. And he was playing in New York. He invited me to see a show. And we started dating. And I went on one date. And that was it. And 12 years later, you know, things are going great. It's a very long date. <laughs> is that too young woman that John alienated on that video and photo shoot uh, some years ago. Elaine, you have uh, had or still have a serious career as a model, um, supermodel. You chose to marry this gentleman and have a family, live in Indiana. Um, some people may call that poor judgment. <laughs> They might call it love. And you were quite young. How, how, how old were you when you married? Um, I was 21 when we started dating. And now it's how many years later? 12 years later. Um, well, no, no, that was like 14 years ago, wasn't you, it? We, when we met. When we met 14 years ago. We've been, we've been married, married 12. 12. We've been married 12 years. You had two divorces, and this is your third wife. Are you a different man? Well, I'll tell you, you know, most men aren't very reliable. Maybe not ever, but not, definitely not until they're 40. Because, you know, guys thinking about themselves all the time. What's this got to do with me? I want to think about me. You know, and of course I fell into that category. And, uh, you know, I was in a rock band, and I'm not making excuses for myself, but it was, I was, it's a different lifestyle. The two of you have two children, two sons. Two together. And we're going to take a look at them and the, the melon camps at home. <laughs> the majority of his life, he's not a singer and he's not a songwriter and he's not a performer. It's here in this house and he's a dad. I had his 10 and his spec is a uh, 9. I like to do anything outdoors with him, play sports with him. But actually, you know, I, I, I just like talking to him. We make an effort at being a family, probably more than most people day to day. I want them to grow up and have a great American Midwestern regular life. My youngest kid, Speck, he is either ready to tear down the house or he's the most loving guy in the world. If HUD is left to his own, he'll pick up a, a stick and go out and fight dragons. I wrote about him in a song called uh, I'm Not Running Anymore. So they got two circus clowns here and they like to fight. They got one black eye and a bloody nose. They are the hoodlums of my third wife. And whatever I say, they will oppose. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! Get him off! Yes! Hey, what are you doing? Look at that. Turn it, baby. <laughs> yeah, I think, um... I, th I think the reason they're applauding is the two of you seem to have done some pretty good work. <laughs> Those are great little guys. Those are the two two nicest guys maybe in the world, I think. And uh, HUD is such a sensitive, creative kid, and Speck is so out of hand. You know? and, I, <laughs> and I'm proud of both. I'm proud of all of, uh, of their features. And uh, uh, The they, names, please, HUD and Speck. HUD is a uh, character out of the Larry McMurtry uh, book called The Horseman Pass By, which was later made into a movie that Paul Newman played HUD. And it was interesting, I did a thing at Radio City a few months ago, uh, and Paul Newman was there, and he came up to my dressing room and, to meet HUD. And it, and, and it was great. And he goes, well, you look like a HUD. And <laughs> HUD was excited about it. What about Speck? He's named after my grandfather. Now, were you um, out of your mind at this moment when your husband named the boys, or were you completely comfortable? 
Well, the name HUD was picked long before I came along, and certainly long before the child came along, so I had no choice. Yeah. Um, well, but here's another, here's another point. We know the alternative. Well, yeah, that's the point. If it had been a girl, I wanted to name it Baby Doll. So I she was HUD so sounded better. HUD sounded better. That sounds insane at that point, see? Yeah. It's all that you compare it to. Yeah. John, you have, uh, you do have three daughters yes. from previous marriages. Right. You have three grandchildren. Yes, I uh, have. Did you know that? Or yeah, is... I, ha I, actually, I actually have four, four? Grand four grandchildren. And uh, I have a, uh, my oldest daughter, who is 32, I think, and uh, she's a, uh, a housewife and uh, lives in Bloomington, and I have... Uh, a 23-year-old daughter who lives in Hollywood and is trying to make her way in the agent business. And, uh, and then I have a 19-year-old daughter who goes to Indiana University. Oh, go Hoosiers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we're glad to hear that. Um, you come from an interesting family. Your father was uh, an electrical uh, company executive. He uh, was a fundamentalist. Your family was fundamentalist, Christian. Um, he was a strict fellow and kind of physical. What have you taken from him as a model for your own fatherhood? It seems like to me that, uh, uh, you know, when the family that I come from, when the men were younger, they were all very angry. Uh, but as time went on, they turned, like my dad is like the nicest guy in the world. Wouldn't you agree? My dad, you know, and I- He could learn a lot from his dad. Yeah, yeah. My dad, my dad, when I was a kid, you know, I had hair down to here and, you know, we bumped up against each other, but now he's the sweetest guy and honest. John Mellencamp has mellowed nicely, uh, but 10 years ago, he had a wake-up call. He had a mild heart attack. We'll talk about other things next. I'm a mother with two young children. My metabolism has slowed down. wants to give 100 percent and wants the show to be perfect just two things that i always have to do i have to be the last one out of the dressing room and lane always has to kiss me and say have a good show john if that doesn't happen then i'm screwed <laughs> Really, really good show last night. Um, I was privileged to see you before and, and where we first met, Elaine and I. Uh, Elaine, do you travel always with John? Generally. When generally. And, and often the kids will come with us. Oh, why is that a necessary ingredient in your professional life now, to have Elaine there? I think that, uh, I, think, I think it's good advice for everybody. You know, problems uh, it, that I've had, in, in, at least in my marriage, is when there is separation. And people, you know, I used to come home from touring, and I wouldn't really know the person I was married to anymore. And, you know, I didn't have anything to talk to him about. Her and I, you know, the, the, the best thing we do is that we're together, and we laugh all the time. I don't know how comfortable you are talking about the, the night after the show, about 10 years or so ago, 10 years ago, when you had that mild heart attack at Jones Beach. That must have been... Right. It was, it was uh, I didn't really know I was having a heart attack. A heart disease is, a, is an interesting thing on top of being a deadly thing. But uh, Elaine probably knows more about heart disease than most doctors. I don't know whether you had just given birth to a son or you were still pregnant with your first Both. son. I was Both. <laughs> Both. pregnant with second and just given birth to one. And your husband has this mild heart attack. Excuse me, I don't want to be morbid or anything, but that must have scared you as a, a very young mother. Well. What I did was just to educate myself and hopefully to be able to help John to try to figure out how you can combat heart disease. Because I didn't know a lot about it, and that's the problem. Nor did he, nor do a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And you think retrospectively, you think, oh, I should have known that. Of course, you know, high cholesterol, smoking. But I don't think that you actually connected to a way, you know, this could happen any day. He's still a smoker. I, listen, I only do one thing well, and that's it, see? That's all I can do good. I, I'm a good smoker. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but you're also a good painter. This is a man who doesn't do things by halves. Uh, like many artists, John Mellencamp can be a nearly obsessive painter. I really liked the solitude of painting. 
it dawned on me that I had been around hundreds of people every day of my life, tours and rock bands. Now all of a sudden I find myself, it's just me in, in a room like this with a paintbrush and an easel, and I hear silence. And at first it was like kind of unnerving, but then I got to like it. And then I got to really like it. And then I didn't even want to make records anymore for a long time. This thing of Speck is kind of his personality. I mean, you know, what I said about him, one minute he can be so uh, rowdy, and then, of course, you know, he has that heart. There was about three years there that I would get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, I would start painting, and I'd quit at 9 o'clock at night. Generally, during the day, your mind drifts around. When you're painting, there's no drifting. And I would be totally focused. I wouldn't even eat. Both those are me. I have thousands of paintings. Most of them have been given away or sold, but I have a whole warehouse full of paintings. Well, they all look like hell. Nevertheless, it was the idea of having something to show for my day. But having something to show for my day, what, do you, what does that mean? Well, you know, time goes by, and, uh, and you know, all of a sudden a month has gone by, and, well, what have you done? Have you done anything this month? And I just don't like that feeling that, uh, that time goes by and we have nothing to show for our time. I think that uh, you have to, at least a as a guy who likes to write songs and paint, uh, and I can tell you what, she wants me to paint. <laughs> Why? Oh, it's really therapeutic for him. I mean, I think it's a really, a day well spent for him personally. If you could be um, as good a painter as you would like to be, would you give up music and do that exclusively? Uh, that day may be around the corner, not even being as good a painter as I want to be. I saw you described recently as an elder rocker, which hurt me a little bit for reasons we've discussed before. Um, are you saying that you're thinking about retiring from music well I don't know about that you know I could never quit writing songs but you know there might come a time when I just I don't want to make records anymore I don't want to you know making records is hard I've made like 21 albums and you know it's hard it's hard work you got to write these songs you got to deal with the band and that's the fun part it's exhausting you know 119 cities and you see the same thing the inside of a hallway of a hotel and the inside of a venue yeah but who'd trade places with him right now <laughs> A man of extraordinary talents and many, many hits. Another song from John Mellencamp. Next. If you're planning a trip to New York City, be a... Relief from Similison. Healthy relief for the symptoms of conjunctivitis. Now available over the counter. Similison Pink Eye Relief at retailers everywhere. Once again with his outstanding band, John Mellencamp. This is a. Uh... This is a song about the devil and what he can do to you if you don't keep your eye on him.
John Mellencamp have released the two CD Words and Music, a retrospective of your career. And a career like you've had, a retrospective is a pretty big deal. A rock and roll career that aims to shake things up. Next. Corporate farming was doing to the small family farmer and because of what corporate farming was doing to the small family farmer and as we can all see now what corporate America is doing to the rest of the country and it's frightening and we need to stop it and uh, we hope we can make just a little dent in it today. Well, in addition to music, the Farm Aid will be uh, among your, your legacies. Am I right to understand that Willie Nelson was inspired by Scarecrow, Rain on the Scarecrow, the song you and the band just performed. Well, here's, here's what happened. Uh, Willie used to come to Bloomington and play golf. 
And uh, he played golf with a friend of mine one day, and Willie was talking on the golf course about uh, he wanted to do a concert a a about the small family farm. And this mutual friend we had said, well, John Mellencamp just recorded a song about exactly that. And so, like, you know, I think in between the ninth hole and the tenth hole, Willie called me up and said, do you want to do this concert with me? And I said, yeah, I don't know. I think he was more inspired by a statement that Bob Dylan made at Live Aid about, you know, this is all great that we're trying to help these, uh, these starving people, but maybe we should try to help the, the farmer in America. You are um, uh, indisputably of the liberal persuasion. Um, well, I think I, think I kind of treat it in a lenient manner. Sometimes I lean this left, and then sometimes I lean real left. <laughs> Um, but would you... I'm a liberal. A liberal. I'm a liberal. Yes, you are. Would you be discouraged uh, from uh, espousing politics, left or right, or anything else, if you were a young recording artist today? I, I don't really like politics, to be honest. It's a dirty, petty business. But this country right now, I think, is in a situation where you know, we all want the same thing, but do we want it at the end of a gun? Or do we want it through logical talk? And I preferably uh, have to hearken back to something that was said in the 60s, if you remember. Rich men having poor men fight their, jo fight their wars for them. And I have always taken that with me. And I don't like the end of a gun. The country changes by the people we admire. And I think that's a very important thing that we should keep in mind. You know, do, do we like where we're at now? Do we like living in fear? And, and I personally don't like it. Well, I didn't want to get in your way and let you have your speech. I want to count to three so we can have some fun in the next segment because you're going to do pink houses. Well, see, pink houses. We'll be back. On the next Montel. A if there is a song most associated with John Mellencamp, it's probably Pink Houses. And if anyone feels moved to join in the chorus, the band won't be at all surprised.
personal pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker, Mr. John Mellencamp. You might wonder, how in the hell did this goofball Mellencamp last so long? Let's see now. Well, he's an okay songwriter. His shows are a little bit above average. Damn good looking fellow, though. Yes. You're a, you're a rock star married to a supermodel. What credibility could you possibly have with those people? Oh, they love me at Indiana University. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a friend to Indiana University. Well, I'm a graduate of Indiana University. They so like you, too. No, 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 I'm a they friend like of you yours. Too. Thank you. Um, you hinted earlier about, about future plans. Uh, how long do you think your, your future uh, of retiring from music is from now i have taken great pleasure my entire life of saying these words jane i've planned nothing my whole life i've never planned nothing and uh i'm going to release a box set someday and it's going to say the name of the album is going to be nothing like we planned so <laughs> i plans you know i think one thing just like you one day i think you know i'm going to do this and the next day i think i'm going to do that and then usually what happens is i don't do either of the above i just <laughs> keep going yeah well, i hope you'll plan to come back and see us sometime this has been really really great well thank you for really having great. me and every member of the audience will be receiving a copy of john's brand new cd <laughs> Camp and all the band. They're fabulous. Uh, for more information on today's program, go to our website, as usual, thejanepaulyshow.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.